birthday, Seattle. We step back in time as Seattle celebrates its 150th anniversary. Seattle's 150th anniversary is referred to as the sesquicentennial. Now it's different. You, know, you don't know nobody in the box now. It's one of the city's most culturally diverse neighborhoods, trying hard to preserve its soul. Right now, I don't see us. So we need to be seen again in this area. History will always look kindly on Lenny Wilkins for making Seattle a championship town. It left a legacy. There's no question about it. And could you ace an exam about the Emerald City? We take you to the Trivia Challenge. <laughs> These stories and more next on City Stream. Hello, I'm Dennis Bounds, and welcome to a special city stream celebrating Seattle's sesquicentennial. Happy 150th anniversary. From a wilderness camp to gold rush fever. From a world's fair to a world-class destination, Seattle has come a long way in 150 years. During that time, a lot of photos, documents, and treasures have accumulated, and the Seattle Municipal Archives is responsible for all of them. In honor of the city's sesquicentennial, archivists have combed through the collection and picked specific items to share with the world. We sent Felix Bennell to find out more. Yeah, I think the city itself has been kind of quiet about it. I mean, we all think it's a big deal. It's good that Anne Frantilla thinks it's a big deal that Seattle incorporated as a city in 1869. Seattle is a century and a half old, and the municipal archives, which were only created in the 1980s, is responsible for taking care of 15 decades worth of priceless materials. But these aren't just a bunch of musty old papers that never see the light of day. In these priceless photos and documents are the hidden backstories of Seattle's streets, neighborhoods, and people. This is the cemetery. Yep, plot of old cemetery. <laughs> Jean Fisher works in the archives. <laughs> and it, down here it says vacated July 10th, 1884. An old ledger and map are the only record of 400 burials in Seattle's first cemetery, which later became its first park. The land was donated by the Denny's and um, it was originally a cemetery and then in 1884, um, the cemetery became the city's first park, um, Denny Park. And so all of the bodies had to be moved from the municipal cemetery um, to different locations. Jean so Fisher says cemetery. that sometimes documents created for one purpose become valuable for entirely different reasons. She points to a multi-page complaint from the 1930s about a downtown newsstand encroaching on a nearby business that included photos as evidence. But what's so great about them is they're also kind of snapshots of the city at that time. So you can see pedestrians, you can see the businesses, you can see the streets. And that's something that you find, you know, in photos all the time in the archives, that they show something that um, is really interesting that's not necessarily the reason why it was created. And it's another complaint that Anne Frantilla says perfectly illustrates the value of archival materials to understand earlier times. We have the records of the cities that were annexed to the city. And this, these were um, petitions regarding livestock boundaries. And what exactly was that long ago Ballard citizen's beef? Another citizen's uh, beef. We considered an imposition to have 25 or 30 cows herded right in our door yard, and each cow with a bell on it. And this is the best line. Also, these herd boys use all kinds of profane and obscene language in the presence of women who come near them. The cows, if not the cussing, are long gone from Ballard, but the Municipal Archives also has extensive documentation of some proposed projects in other parts of town that never came to be in the first place. In the 1960s, the Thompson Expressway would have bisected the Arboretum and the Japanese Garden. The Archives has what can only be called beautiful artist renderings of what it might have looked like to have a freeway running right through this iconic, tranquil spot. Julie Eyrick is the city's photo archivist. She says a focus of the 150th anniversary is broadening standard interpretations to better reflect the diversity that's been there in the old pictures all along, such as from this anti-housing discrimination protest along Aurora Avenue in the 1960s. We had to look closely at the demonstration records from the uh, redlining era and try not to center those 
entries on what the white people were doing in the photographs, but rather what were the black people doing in the photographs, since they were the ones being affected by the redlining. And let's hope the Seattle Municipal Archives keeps preserving and making accessible the records of the city's first 150 years and its next 150 years, and all the years that follow. I think one of the, the most interesting things or one of the, the best things to come out of this will be that public awareness and that we are holding the records of that important conversation that occurs between citizens and their own government. The Seattle at 150 exhibit is on display at the Seattle Municipal Tower and the book Seattle at 150 is on sale now at major bookstores. Next on City Stream, a documentary reveals the concern as a Seattle neighborhood struggles to save its soul. Later, the city's soul is lifted after this big win. Hear from the leader who helped guide Seattle to a championship. I really believe that this team could do it. Welcome back from the Seattle Channel Studios. It stood for 65 years and helped Seattle motor into the modern age. Despite its drab exterior, the Alaskan Way Viaduct was beloved for these breathtaking views. But as sturdy as it was, it was no match for the 2001 Nisqually earthquake, and the viaduct's compromised span had to go. It shut down for good in January 2019, and within months, it was gone, transforming Seattle's waterfront forever. Producer Randy Eng goes back in time to see how it all came about. You know, the viaduct has been in the civic imagination for a long time. Uh, decades before it was actually built, people dreamed of a freeway that would circumvent downtown Seattle. There was so much congestion, particularly on the waterfront. You know, we were a shipping center and the waterfront was busy with shipbuilding, with cargo being transferred. They wanted to get all the traffic out of their backyard, so to speak. They wanted to have free access to the piers and to all the shipping activity that happened downtown. So the viaduct was a way to um, circumvent that. Remember that in the early 20th century, the number of cars on the street was proliferating. We think of traffic jams now. There were traffic jams back then on streets that had not even seen a car a few years before. So somehow building a route that would get through all that, beneath all that, or as it turned out, above all that, was long dreamed of, and that's what led eventually to the viaduct. Uh, originally, the dream was that there would be two, one on the west, which is essentially what the viaduct became, and one on the east, which eventually became I-5. But the viaduct pathway was the cheaper and easier to construct, principally because so much of the right-of-way was already publicly owned. So the viaduct got the attention, it got the money, and uh, they broke ground in 1950. But the interesting thing is they didn't actually complete the viaduct until 1966. It was a 15-year-plus project. Uh, some engineers wanted the freeway to just cut through the city with very few chances to get off in the middle of downtown. But think about those downtown merchants and property owners. They didn't want all those cars flying past them. They wanted those cars to end up in downtown and essentially become their customers. So there was a lot of debate about where do we put the on and off ramps in the central part of the city. In fact, the Downtown Seattle Association was formed in part to help mitigate the impacts of the viaduct and to make sure the viaduct was serving downtown as well as the suburbs to the north and south. Many cities, as a major infrastructure project, created elevated highways. There were many cities that wanted to bypass the clutter of what was on the street level. So the West Side Highway in New York, Wacker Drive in Chicago, the Embarcadero in San Francisco, the viaduct fell into that category. There was really design remorse even before it was built. Some of the best architects in the city took strong objection to the notion of this elevated freeway. Uh, they thought the uh, pylons were too thick, they thought the roadway itself was too ungainly, they felt it had absolutely no design amenities that would make it a more 
more compatible part of the visual landscape. So from the very beginning, people said, you know, this, this doesn't look right. But the engineers, as often happens in Seattle history, held sway. Uh, they said it may not be beautiful, but it will be functional, it will be utilitarian, and it will be affordable. And that carried the day. Ultimately, 100,000 cars a day would use the viaduct. And this was just in the first couple of years of its use. So from the very beginning, it solved a, a core transportation challenge. A couple little known facts. Um, as the original designs were being uh, presented to the public, one of Seattle's great architects, Paul Theory, said, you know what you really need to have is a tunnel. So it's interesting that in some ways history is the future going back to where we were decades ago. Another fact that I love to share with people is that our uh, Governor Dan Evans, his very first job as a young engineer was to help design the viaduct. Now another progress report from Mayor Clinton. I thought perhaps you'd be interested in seeing a few of our most recent traffic improvements. The Broad and Mercer Street underpass, the Alaskan Way viaduct extension. The viaduct was really a signal of Seattle's coming of age as a modern American city after the war. You couldn't be a modern city if you had to have all your cars go on surface streets. You had to have that freeway. It let Seattleites know that we were a modern, growing, progressive American city. It will definitely be a passing of an era, but I think where we can take some comfort is that we know that what's coming next is universally believed to be an improvement in terms of how we can reconnect with our central waterfront. One man who knew the viaduct better than most is Ed McNaughton. For years, he lived about 40 feet from his noisy neighbor. But that was then. Things are much different now. My view, so I like it, it's all right. I got some pot water and then concrete. And then out of every window I see the concrete. Concrete, that's all you see right here. Concrete there, concrete, 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 concrete. <laughs> Live life with the viaduct. It's uh, loud, you know, you can hear it now, but you get used to it after so many years. At first, you couldn't stand it. And then uh, the sirens, cars in the morning, get used to all that. You see the traffic stopping. You see all the wrecks that are down this way because they stopped this way. See, I'm from New York City, too. I just lived with it because it was good to be living here, you know? Four o'clock, five o'clock, they'll be dump bumper to bumper, and you see all the people, you can wave to them. Hey, hey, slow down. <laughs> and if I had a big long stick, I could probably sell coffee. <laughs> when they close it down, come on, we're gonna have a killer view. That's for damn sure. Yeah, the viaduct's gone. <laughs> the view, the light, it's all changed. It's a different world. I can see the ballparks. I can't believe it. They're right there. <laughs> we closed for the week. They were directly in front. They, they tried their best to mitigate the dust, but it was very dusty. Walk sign is on. Crossing Alaskan Way. Walk across the street and look at the city. You'll see buildings. You've been there forever. You didn't even know you were there. It definitely changes the perspective from, from this side of the waterfront, looking back towards the city. I don't know if it's mental, but there seemed to be sort of a block there before. Just this fuzzy gray area you can't see through. We're right next to the waterfront now, instead of the other side underneath the viaduct. It's brought the city together. It's a new city. Another historic neighborhood undergoing dramatic change is Seattle's Central District. Gentrification has altered the area's economic and social fabric. And many African Americans still living there believe the Central District is losing its soul. Enrique Cerna has more from the neighborhood. 23rd and Union, the heart of the Central District. Like much of Seattle, it is no longer what it used to be. Now it's different. You, know, you don't know nobody in the blocks now. Earl Lancaster grew up in the CD. Through the window of his barber shop on Union, Earl's Cuts and Styles, he watches as it continues to change. He sees construction going on across the street. New apartments and businesses have gentrified the neighborhood, driving up property values and taxes. 
a lot of families moved out the neighborhood and out south where uh, they can afford. It bothers Earl that most newcomers are unaware of the Central District's significant African-American history. Its memorable businesses, such as Helen's Diner, and owner Helen Coleman, whose soul food was so good that celebrities like comedian Richard Pryor had to have it when he came to town. Smothered pork chops, greens, yams, macaroni and cheese, um, and her peach cobbler was the bomb. But most troubling for longtime residents is that the African-American community, once a large majority in the Central District, has declined dramatically to a mere 14% of the population here. Poof, there's no black community no more. It is a great sense of loss. The sense of community goes away, but also the sense of economic and political power goes away. My name is Jeff Shulman. I'm a professor at the University of Washington's Foster School of Business. I host the Seattle Growth Podcast, and I produced and co-directed a documentary, On the Brink. Through voices from the community, On the Brink looks at the changes in the Central District and the human impact. The loss is different is, is that it's, it's visible, it is painful. Time after time, talking to individuals in the Central District, these individuals felt ignored, kind of forgotten, and left behind in the changes. Central District was the largest enclave of African Americans in the Pacific Northwest. The film tells the rich history of the Central District. It examines how and why economic and racial discriminatory policies dating back to the 1930s made the CD the African American area of Seattle. And despite the barriers, how the community made its own way to contribute greatly to the city's social and cultural fabric. On the Brink is about bringing attention to voices that are often not, not heard. I myself hadn't heard this rich history at, for 10 years after living in Seattle. And so we're just trying to help people understand why, while there's seeming progress, and there is a lot of progress for a lot of people here, uh, this same progress is leading to a sense of trauma and loss to some of our community members. Right now, I don't see us. So we need to be seen again in this area. And at this point, it's like financially, it's a struggle trying to get us back in here. Many people say the trains left the station, you know, and uh, there's no African-American community, so why should we care? Just Arnell Hinton and Donald King are two vocal community members featured in the documentary. Both are committed to keeping the legacy of the CD and finding ways for African Americans to regain their presence. I'd like to see, uh, create a situation where black owned businesses can come back again and flourish here in this area. We should care because there's still African American institutions left, there's still homeowners left, there's still property owners left and business owners left. We are not free of the racism that really caused that community to be, to be built in the first place. So until we can be freed up from that, we are no, no better off being integrated or assimilated into the majority population. What has happened in the Central District through Seattle's rapid growth and gentrification is not unique. It is happening in other parts of the country too. Jeff Shulman says for Seattle, it should be considered a cautionary tale of what could happen to other marginalized neighborhoods here. As we're trying to build a shared future, we have to remember that we didn't have an equitable and shared past that has long-standing implications today. Back at the barber shop, Earl Lancaster keeps an eye on his changing neighborhood. Like others, he had a chance to move south, but he decided to stay in the CD to maintain his community and to build its future. Keep a heartbeat in the Central District for uh, folks as myself. If you'd like to learn more about the documentary and upcoming screenings, go to onthebrinkmovie.com. As we look back on the city's history, one park helped the plane maker develop into a manufacturing giant. That's next on City Screen.
We return to this special sesquicentennial edition of City Stream from the Seattle Municipal Archives. To commemorate the milestone, the City Archives partnered with History Link to create this fascinating book, Seattle at 150. Happy birthday, Seattle! Yeah. Seattle's 150th anniversary is referred to as the sesquicentennial. Yes, it's pretty cool. It's kind of hard to imagine that we are now 150 years old. 150 seems like a huge old number, but really it isn't. We're a city of rich diversity and background. We've had a lot of challenges and tribulations, um, but we've made the city we are today, and I think it's a really important time to be thinking about what do we want that city to be looking like for the next 150 years? To be able to place like where I'm standing now on this picture is actually, and how much it's changed, is actually really amazing. We have an incredible amount of talent in Seattle Municipal Archives, and so their ability to review all of these permanent and historical documents and determine a way in which we can tell the story of Seattle's history throughout the years um, was just a phenomenal task. And I think this is a great time to remember, where did we come from, where do we want to go? We've moved down to the city's municipal archives vault where thousands of records are kept here. The city's incredible parks are highlighted in this book, Seattle at 150. One park in particular, Magnuson Park, played a key role in the city's largest private employer. As Felix Bennell reports, Boeing rose to prominence following its experience along the shores of Lake Washington. It's fairly well known that Seattle's Magnuson Park was once the site of a naval air station. The old hangars and remnants of concrete runways were silent witness to the military activities here from the 1920s to the 1970s, and now many have been converted to recreational uses. What's not as well known is how much the Boeing Company's early history and Sandpoint history are linked together almost from the time a plane first landed there in 1920. The Sandpoint connection is a very interesting one. I wish, frankly, as a historian, that we knew more about it than we do. Dan Hagedorn knows more about aviation history than just about anyone around here. He says that not many people know that in the 1920s, Sandpoint was a key part of Boeing's rapid growth as an aviation leader. Boeing did very actively make use of that airport simply because there were very few hard surface, long runway areas capable of taking the airplanes of the day. Boeing historian Mike Lombardi says that, believe it or not, Sandpoint was where Boeing actually assembled some of its earliest aircraft. This was the site where Boeing delivered all of its first airplanes. And the very first commercial airplanes, the Model 40s, the planes were actually assembled right there out in the field. The Boeing mechanics who put together the company's own planes at Sand Point also played a critical role in the famous, but mostly forgotten, around the world flight that began on the shores of Lake Washington almost a hundred years ago. In 1924, the, um, the United States Army had this goal to be the first to fly around the world. And uh, Douglas Aircraft built, built the airplanes, the Douglas World Cruisers, to do that flight. And those planes were flown up to Sandpoint, and Boeing modified the airplanes, put uh, floats on them so they could fly off of Lake Washington and then continue their route to uh, across the Pacific with floats. There was a monument created for that, for that event, big, a big statue of an eagle, and was uh, always prominent. Today, um, you'll, if you blink, you miss it. That monument was dedicated in 1924, but Boeing's connection to Sand Point lasted well into the late 1930s, the age of the legendary Boeing Clipper. 
the 42-ton Pan American flying boat Yankee Clipper makes aerial history. The Boeing Clipper was probably one of the most romantic of all of Boeing's planes. It was a huge flying boat. It was elegant in terms of its service. It even had silverware. Uh, one of the most romantic of Boeing's planes, but one that seems so distant from us today. While not technically part of Sand Point, it was just north of there that Boeing tested those famous clippers. Boeing set up a facility there at Matthews Beach. Almost a year there, the clippers were flying pretty, pretty regular. That would have been quite the thing to see. With all the Boeing history and so much more at Magnuson Park and Matthews Beach these days, it's a special part of Seattle that's still quite the thing to see. Next on City Stream, as Seattle celebrates 150 years, we honor those who inhabited these lands thousands of years prior. watching a special sesquicentennial edition of City Stream. Seattle at 150. Hello, I'm Dennis Bounds. We are in Seattle City Hall next to this 72-foot art installation called Evolving Wing and the Gravity of Presence. Artist Eric Robertson of First Nations Descent describes it as a visual journey about honor, connection, contradiction, and continuum. And as we commemorate the city's 150th anniversary, it's important to note that Seattle is on land that's been inhabited by Coast Salish people for thousands of years. In fact, the city is named after Chief Self, leader of the Duwamish and Suquamish tribes. One of his descendants is among those who shared important perspectives with producer Ian DeVere. I'm Cecile Hansen and I'm the chair of the Duwamish tribe. Our people are here and we're, we're all over the place, so I like to say to everybody, our people are here. The story of the Duwamish tribe is that they're the aboriginal indigenous people of Seattle. I am the great, great, great niece of Chief Seattle. that when he spoke, they listened and they honored him. They respected him at that time, and they should do that today. We were approached by the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the um, early 1850s regarding our land, which is the land that we resided on, all our villages, to help us and to secure the land for settlers they were coming out from the East Coast. Our leaders, in their wisdom, decided to agree to the agreement to give up our land, which was 54,000 acres. And then they promised us many things, which they did not fulfill those promises.
I have been for the last 40 years trying to meet with every mayor of this city to pass a resolution saying, very simple, we support the Duwamish tribe of Seattle for whatever reason. That meeting has not happened. The point is that we probably would have been acknowledged a long time ago if the federal government had given us a reservation or a piece of property. I'm very saddened that this city has a lot of homeless people. And, and I have told my tribal council, I said, if we were to get knowledge and have that title back, we would do more for homeless people. We would, we would, that would be a priority for us. Because looking back, we were homeless too. Having given up 54,000 acres, and we now own two thirds of an acre. We are very, very proud of what we're doing today with our Duwamish Cultural Center and, and to sharing our history, which comes from our chief. I think he has influenced me because I am a, a, a Duwamish and I honored the way that he spoke the truth and I believe in the truth of the history of Seattle. So that keeps me determined. I think the most encouraging thing that I've, that I've realized that a lot of people support the Duwamish tribe. It's amazing. I just, this just happened this last week that a teach, two teachers showed up and they shared these little um, cards and they said, Dear Chief Cecile Hansen, I'm not a chief, but that's what they said in all these cards. And it brought tears to my eyes, and they kept saying to me, you keep fighting. I was so moved by that. It's all wonderful that they're celebrating 150 years, but I think that they should be celebrating back 164 years when the people were here, because they haven't done that, I believe. They haven't celebrated the Duwamish tribe, who gave up so much on behalf of this city. And Duwamish means the people who are inside. But we seem to be on the outside of what this is all about. The Duwamish people won federal recognition as a tribe in 2001. But a year later, that decision was reversed. In 2015, the tribe appealed. And today, that case is still pending before the Board of Indian Appeals. For years, Seattle struggled for legitimacy in the sports world. It finally achieved greatness in the summer of 79 when the Seattle Supersonics won the NBA crown. That title cemented Seattle's standing as a championship city. And many point to the leadership of one man who made it happen. Producer Randy Eng explains. I'm Lenny Wilkins, and I was the coach of the Seattle Supersonics 1979 championship team. <laughs> Seattle at that time really didn't want people to know where Seattle was on the map. They wanted to be the hidden treasure up in the Northwest, you know. <laughs> and, and so it really wasn't a big, big sports town. As we put the team together, I felt it could be good. Traded for John Johnson, second round pick, and got him. And I traded just a draft choice to get Gus Williams. Dennis I put in the starting lineup, and uh, I put Lonnie in the lineup and I moved Jack to center. Jack Blossom and Fred came into his own, you know, and then to bring Paul off the bench, we were quicker. We, we were gonna play a little up-tempo. You put Gus in the lineup, how, how can you not run? We, we didn't have all the superstars on the team, but yeah, our team was a fun team to watch. 
and you know, we win a championship. When we came home at the airport, there were over 20,000 fans. I mean, where, where have you seen that? You know, it, it was amazing. And then the parade, there were like over 300,000 people at the parade, you know, and it was just wonderful. After we won the championship, it kind of put Seattle on the map. People were wanting to come here for vacations just to see what the Northwest was like. And, uh, and big uh, companies, Boeing, Nintendo, and we had a couple other companies, you know. People were wanting to come here. Also the players, they wanted to play in this area. And uh, some of them still live here. You know, I think it's a huge accomplishment. It left a legacy, there's no question about it. Of course, Seattle is not a one championship town. In fact, the Sounders just won their second MLS Cup. Also winning championships, the Metropolitans, the Seahawks, the Storm, and the Seawolves. As we have seen 150 years ago, Seattle was basically a wilderness. A century ago, much of the city had cows wandering through it and looked a lot like the place Jenny Cunningham takes us to now. What comes to mind when someone says South Seattle? Likely you're visualizing planes, trains, and automobiles, not goats, horses, and hay. And yet, just a little bit east of this forest of 737s at Boeing Field, well, hang on, sweetheart. a pocket of peace survives. Okay, maybe not peace exactly, this whole place is illogical, but that's why it's so cool, because it's fun. These 20 plus acres are likely Seattle's last family farm. It's home to Gloria, also known as Grandma, Mom, that's Lisa, Dad, Garth, their kids, Army and Gigi, and another kid, Bambi. Like we like being a little different, <laughs> a little bit more wild. The delightful Safara Olson family has been running wild right here for five generations. My grandparents immigrated from Europe and they lived on First Hill. And my grandmother had grown up on a farm and she didn't like living in a city lot. And this reminded her a little bit of rural Spain. And so that was how she directed the family to move here. Do you remember milking the cow? Of course. Yeah. My grandpa, well, when he was milking his cow, the kitties would come around and he could squirt them with the, with the milk, the milk right from the cow. So grandma, you never did learn to milk a cow because you're holding your hand wrong. You milk it like this. Here's how the farm stayed in the family. Gloria's grandparents sold the farm to her fiance. The couple married, moved in with three horses and a dog. Then the Saferas added more acres and two daughters, Linda and Lisa. Over the years, Gloria gave her love of horses full reign. She rescued horses, she bred ponies, and the farm became a kid magnet. It still is. Today, a new generation is learning to ride, getting a rare taste of country living in the city. It is a little heaven here, and I don't know what I would do without it. Farms didn't used to be rare. As late as 1950, according to the U.S. Census, there were more than 100 farms in Seattle. Ballard was known for dairies, Magnolia too. We are at the epicenter of modern Seattle, also known as South Lake Union, where Amazon, Facebook, and Google appear to be competing for who can have the coolest offices. In 1885, Amazon was a jungle. Mercer Street was a brand new wagon road. And believe it or not, right here, at the corner of Bourne and Mercer, there was a pretty big farm where the Raper family grew vegetables and raised chickens. These days, the only reason a chicken would cross this road would be to commit suicide, most foul. And speaking of farm critters in traffic. I remember perfectly the home telephone rang. In the fall of 1985, back at Seattle Farm, teenage Lisa just got home from school when the phone rang. I can remember it perfectly. Your steer is on I-5 headed north towards Seattle. Lisa and her sister Linda sat in stunned silence. 
That's when they heard it, news helicopters. So we got in the horse trailer and we followed the helicopters. That's how we found our steer. The Roundup made front page news as Linda threw her body across the steer and police helped the girls wrangle it, unhurt, into the trailer. A more serious family story starting about 20 years ago involves Gloria. Lisa, who is a physician, was in medical school at the time. She saw symptoms that her mom might have cancer, which turned out to be true. I'm so glad. Army remembers saying goodbye to his grandma in the hospital more than once. She like would be on her deathbed again, like every time, and then she'd be like, grain the horses. No one offered to baby the horses. Army believes that's why his grandma rallied. This is the Cushing's disease medicine because the horse I'm going to give it to has the equivalency of human diabetes. Today, Gloria has been cancer free for years and she's out here every day spoiling these ponies. He took it out of my hand because he loves his baby food and he loves his medicine. So there's a lot to celebrate. 100 years to the day since this family got the deed to Seattle Farm. This is like the most important person here, my mother. Everyone is here, old neighbors and friends. Happy birthday to you. As the candles on the centennial cake are lit, a question hangs in the air. Can Seattle's last farm escape development? I do think that it, well, it is um, maybe the largest privately held residential piece of land left in the city that's undeveloped. Builders make offers. I mean, it's worth a lot of money, so. But I don't, I don't have any intention on selling it. How could you sell the place where Army learned to grow giant pumpkins? Where Gigi became a champion rider? When I think about the future, I don't know how I'm gonna like top this place. Where Grandma rescued horses, and they rescued her right back. Back in the saddle again. For the foreseeable future, Seattle Farm is not for sale. And isn't it good to know that somewhere in the heart of the Emerald City, horses still run free. Before you hop in the car and head to Rainier Beach, you should know that the Seattle farm is not usually open to the public. The owners wish it could be, but with horses wandering around, tractors and such, liability is simply too huge. So, circle the first Saturday in October. One day of the year, the public is welcome. Meantime, the welcome ad is always out at Seattle's oldest Chinese restaurant. Tai Tung has been serving customers in the Chinatown International District since 1935. And as Josephine Chang reports, not much has changed over the years. And that's the way customers like it. Head to one of the oldest blocks in Seattle's International District. Walk through these 80-something-year-old wooden doors. Hey, Dave, how are you? You want some tea? You will see time standing still. You don't want to change. We don't want to change it. Geo by Tommy! Owner Harry Chan doesn't mind when folks say Tai Tung Restaurant is frozen in time. Same counter, cash register even some of the same customers. We've been coming here for 50 years. I've been here for 54 years. My mother uh, came with them when she was four years old. So that in 1948, they first started coming here. And then when I was born in 63, this is the first restaurant I came to. I brought my two children here, and we have now brought our grandson here. Oh my God. So, so five generations. Before the war, back in 1935, when Harry Chan's grandfather first opened Tai Tung, it was an instant hit, especially with single men, migrant workers from Asia, who used it as a hangout and a door of opportunity. A Tai Tung uh, employed a number of these folks. I sort of considered them like my uncles, even though they were really weren't you know, who worked uh, for um, uh, very little money, but you know, they had a place in the neighborhood. Okay, bye. Like Eddie Moy, a lifelong Tai Tung waiter who no longer collects a paycheck, but can't help occasionally still helping out. 
Taitung, everybody know me up there. Everybody looking, everybody know me. Back when Eddie started, Chinatown had many Everybody Knows Me restaurants. But few became a magnet for celebrities. Sports stars, billionaires, politicians, and celebrity chefs all helped over the years to make Tai Tung a tourist draw. Some customers come in who really only want one particular table, this one. That's because of who used to claim this as his spot. It's now the stuff of Seattle legend, how martial arts star Bruce Lee often plunked down here, had a curtain shielding his table after he became famous, and always ordered the usual. Of course, his favorite dishes is uh, oyster sauce, beef with rice. Oyster sauce, beef with rice. Yeah. That was his favorite. That's his favorite dessert. You know, if he come by himself, that's all he, he eat. From the beginning, Tai Tung offered Chinese American food like chop suey. Well, chop suey is, is a term that um, actually refers to a mixture of different ingredients. The chop suey era also featured a bold, distinctive look. All these restaurants had neon signs, and they were part of the era, the neon sign era of the 50s and 60s. And when they're out there, they really were the best advertisement for this Chinese chop suey meal that um, you could get. In the late 60s, Tai Tung underwent its first and only major remodel, which sent its landmark neon sign to the trash heap. A move Harry regrets and now has the power to reverse. We have a lot of customers, you know, see, they want to see the side, the old side. So that way the side can bring back the history and the memory of the good time that they have here. So in late 2017, Harry had the old sign recreated and proudly rehung. Oh, I love it. I saw it when I came in today. I thought, my goodness, I haven't seen that. And, you know. I'd like to say centuries. But <laughs> <laughs> so while the International District is changing and modernizing, as long as Harry is in charge, I'm a young man. <laughs> tai Tung never will. And I have a lot of customers tell us, don't change it. Tradition is important, I think. Um, it gives people a, a sense of place, a sense of identity. When they come to Tai Tung, they know this is Tai Tung. Next on City Stream, as the city celebrates the big 150. Trivia buffs battle it out over who knows Seattle best. So you think you know Seattle? Could you ace an exam on the Emerald City? Dozens of Seattleites put their history skills to the test to celebrate the city's sesquicentennial. Brian Callanan reports from Trivia Night. The Fremont Dock Sports Bar and Grill may not look like a civics classroom. All right, so who's ready to get started with some Seattle trivia? But on a loud October night, this crowd is learning plenty. I wish I was almost your choice. Sia Shonk is one of four dozen contestants at a trivia night celebrating the 150th anniversary of the incorporation of the city of Seattle. The best answer is Denny. Denny, yes. Oops, Sia missed that one. The family name of the group credited as Seattle's first non-indigenous settlers. We live on Denny Street, and we didn't get that one right. And the questions did not get any easier. In between the two of us, we have something, but it's pretty tough. This trivia night also marked the debut of a new book, Seattle at 150, the Seattle Municipal Archives and History Link project that's drawing rave reviews. City archivist Anne Frantilla says the 256 page book of 150 photos or documents from the archives tells the story of a constantly developing city. What type of building once stood 
where the park is now located. Some of these questions were a challenge, even for longtime city employees. But Mass City Clerk Monica Simmons explains that's all part of the fun. A lot of people know a, a lot about Seattle, but we wanted to take a little more and make sure they really understood their community. From public figures to public works, anyone who hadn't polished up on their Emerald City history was history. And we did our homework, we came prepared. City Council Legislative Assistant Shana Deitch of the Vegan Cannibals team says this event is all about bringing a sense of civic pride outside council chambers and into the neighborhoods where it belongs. I'm just really excited for us to be out of City Hall and to be with our constituents. Uh, welcome to District 4. Council member Abel Pacheco sponsored the Sesquicentennial Trivia Night and the city's youngest council member says he's here to celebrate Seattle's past and future. It's an exciting time to be here. So I'm looking forward to the next 150. All right, cool. I'll be a little more great. Yeah, right. <laughs> The winner of the trivia contest gets their own free copy of this collection of stories about Seattle's history. So you better make sure your answers are by the book. Pencil this one in if you think you know it. Name one of the two other uses of Seattle's original city hall, built in 1882. So a lot can change here with this final question. If you answered fire engine house or jail, you might be able to challenge the champs next time. Rachel Price, Tobin Eckholt, and Ben Wilson otherwise known as Team Sesquicensational. I've been in Seattle for 20 some years, so I guess some knowledge accumulated during that time and uh, you know, we just kind of uh, put our heads together and found a win. Okay, final question. Does the intense study of a century and a half of municipal history lead to feelings of intense thirst? Please conduct any research on this matter responsibly. But do raise a glass to toast a city celebrating 150 years of colorful history. Happy birthday, Seattle. Everybody's planning to see Seattle's spectacular $100 million World's Fair. So pack up your troubles and forget your cares. Pack up your family and head for the past in Seattle. Welcome to the future and all the wonders of the 21st century in the greatest preview the world has ever seen. It's the big thrilling adventure of a lifetime. Opening April 21st to October 21st in Seattle. During the past hour, we have examined Seattle's remarkable history, its culture, character, and cuisine. And we end with one final C, community. For half a century, Sunset Bowl was a popular Ballard hangout. Even though it closed in 2008, many have fond memories of this lively place where everyone felt welcome, connected, and embraced by community. Sunset Bowl opened in 1957, and. There's a picture of it the opening year. For the past 31 years, half his life, General Manager Verl Lowry has been building up the business at Sunset Bowl. We have roughly a thousand league bowlers and roughly about 2,000 people come through the door each week. But the building up is over as Sunset Bowl prepares to close forever. It's like a death. You know, it's a death. For Verl and everyone else we talk to, it's more than a bowling alley shutting down. It's more personal than that. We have a personality here and they're comfortable here. This is like coming and spending time uh, with a lot of people around you and, and uh, we're always the same people that are here. Tell me about the regular stuff. Well, this is a shame because there's so many elderly people that come and bowl and they have lunch and bowl and now I don't know where they're gonna go. And young people come every weekend, there's a waiting line for families coming in to bowl. Jack Workman washed his first dishes at Sunset Bowl when he was 20 years old. That was 42 years ago. Now, Jack's losing a job and a family. Oh, some of the girls, you know, we always get together once in a while, have a Christmas party and birthday party. They, they, they bring cakes all the time, you know. Then there are the customers, many who have come to Sunset Bowl every day for years, decades even. I'm sick. It's a disaster, is what it is. A lot of old seniors eat here. 
It's going to be tearful. I've known a lot of the people here for probably 20 years. So it's, yeah, it's pretty sad. It is sad, but Sunset Bowl is closing because nobody goes bowling anymore. Right, Verl? Sunset Bowl is so busy with leagues and open bowling and everything, and so we are busier than we ever have been. Wait a minute, Verl. Say that again? We are busier than we ever have been. So why then is a thriving business and popular gathering place shutting down all of a sudden? Basically, the property has become more valuable, become more valuable than the business. I guess when you add up all the reasons to keep Sunset Bowl open, 51 years in business, 50 employees, the 24-hour restaurant, 26 lanes, plus thousands of loyal customers, they fall far short of the 13.2 million reasons the place is closing down. <laughs> Money talks. <laughs> you can say that again. The partnership that owned Sunset Bowl for 51 years recently sold the land for a whopping $13.2 million to a developer who will likely build, you guessed it, luxury condos. I think there's too many condominiums and too many apartment houses being built in Ballard. It's just not the same old Ballard anymore. Just have a good time and have a oh, wonderful yeah. life. Yep. Now the staff prepares to shut down Sunset for the last time, consoling the regulars and themselves and readying the fixtures for the inevitable auction. But then what happens? Come Sunday, I'm going to be unemployed. I'm going to take about a week, a month off, and then I'm going to go find a job out in the North End. I live out in Clearview. I really have no idea. Oh, I don't know. I'm, just, I'm thinking about just retiring. Really. Barb's been here 31 years. She started about a month and a half after I came to work here. You can't attach a dollar figure to it, and you certainly won't get rich providing it to people. Thank you. But something valuable is being demolished along with Sunset Bowl. And the only word for that something is community. My customers are my friends. This is Bert. He comes in every day and plays cribbage and oh, yeah. has coffee. And, and my employees are my friends. This is Gene. What, Gene, you started here in 1970? 1971. I mean, it, it's kind of like the last day of high school, but high school was 31 years for me. And that wraps up this special episode of City Spring from Seattle City Hall. I'm Dennis Bounds. Thanks for watching. And oh, happy 150th anniversary, Seattle.